you know, the, the thing that I can say to parents is, and, and this may not be um, what they want to hear right now, but this is probably the best time for them to hear it, is you really, I would highly suggest that you start reevaluating what it is you want for your child in the future. Like, really. Look, start, start looking into what is going on with automation. Like, what are the projections? Um, is, is your child being prepared? Like, do you remember most of what you were taught in school? Do you use most of what you were taught in school in your current job? And I think that you'll find that the school system didn't really prepare you. What it really did is it served as a filtering system. It's like, if I can get to grade eight versus grade 12 versus three years of college versus you know, a master's degree, a, a, a company knows, okay, if you got through a master's degree, I know you can be trusted to handle a certain level of responsibility and information and so forth. But I'm not expecting you really, in most cases, to use any of that information. I have something I want you to do, but if you couldn't even get past eighth grade, I can't trust you to be in this position, so you can have this position, right? And so they call that the propedeutic function, right? John Taylor Gatto talks about that, and um, you know, it's been discussed even you know, since like the early 1900s that this is one of the purposes of school from the perspective of the elite, those who are you know, more making the, the decisions that affect most people's lives, they see it as a filtering system rather than it producing the result that they want. It's more like identifying. You know, they have lots of tests and so forth, like the SAT and other types of tests that allow, um, at the upper levels of society, they allow them to identify, <clears throat> okay, who are the people in our current pool of people that exist on the planet, in our population, in our country, who are the people who are highly intelligent and process information because we want to get to those. And then they have specialized scholarships, like, for example, Rhodes scholarships and Fulbright scholarships and things like that. Um, and, and I know this firsthand because when I was in university, I was being groomed, so to speak, for a Rhodes scholarship. Um, you know, fortunately, I made some decisions that led me into a different path, which is where I'm at now. Um, but, you know, those types of positions like Rhodes Scholars and Fulbrights, that's where you become like president, that's where you become, you know, like diplomats, uh, you know, uh, senators, you know, uh, many of those people go on to become, you know, anchors that, you know, MSNBC or CNN and things like that, where you become sort of the pillars of the current system and the mouthpieces in many, in, in many senses to kind of keep things going the way they are. Um, and so the, the, the upper levels of society, the elite, if you want to call them that, they have ways of using the education system to find the people that they want to, you know, kind of steer into, you know, do I want this person to be in the CIA or an intelligence officer or an officer in the military or whatever the case may be, right? Um, and and that, that is one thing I would suggest people really start to look at is this, the education system is not doing what, as a parent, you think it is. It's not there to to really develop your child's full potential. It's there just to find the point in the system that the system wants them to be in. The problem is that system is collapsing. Like we're seeing it happen in real time. Uh, we're seeing a preview for it anyways. You know, who knows how long this whole thing will go on. But this isn't, I mean, really, does anyone out there think this is the last time there's going to be a pandemic? Because, you know, and I know right now there's lots of information. People are, some people think the whole thing is a hoax. Some people think that it's real, but it's, you know, being blown out of proportion. Some people think it's, it's all true, what, what everyone is saying about it. You know, there's all kinds of different opinions. But one thing we know for sure is that the media can say there's a pandemic and everyone can freak out and they can get everyone to stay home and they can shut down the economy. Regardless of whether it's all true or not is not the point. The point is that is the effect that the media, which is really just the media and the government, but the media is, is, the, is the mouthpiece for all of this. It's where people are getting their information from. Um, it can, it can cause people to behave in a certain way. And so if you think about it, if you put everyone through an education system and you know that most people come out of that system with a, like, let's say, fourth grade reading ability, then you know, okay, most people can't handle eighth grade or 12th grade or college-level material. So if I use certain words and certain vocabulary, I know most people won't understand it. They're just going to react with emotion. So I'm going to embed that with some emotion and some imagery, and I'm going to get people to do what I want. So the education system has become a way of putting people through a process that then it's easily 
we're, they're e easily able to predict what the response to certain words and certain information will be because they know because they set up the system in the first place. Um, you know, because kind of going back to what you had asked me earlier, like how have we survived this so far with the economy? And that's, that's what scientific management is all about. And really school system has become a tool of scientific management to manage society. You know, and we like to think that we have, you know, free will and free choice and things like that. But, but for the most part, our behavior is predictable. Um, you know, I have this one client, a technical tutor client actually, who, um, well, I won't say their name obviously or anything like that, but they worked as a consultant, let's say for a major corporation. I don't want to say too much, but a major corporation that everybody knows. And there was a, there was a documentary that had come out that did a lot of damage, not only to that specific corporation, well, no, to that corporation specifically. And it, it totally caught them, you know, off foot, you know, and, and it just, it hit their bottom line. It was a disaster for them. Um, they're still around. They're still the biggest name in this, in their industry. Um, but, you know, at that level, it's all about shareholder value, and, and they didn't want um, that to ever happen again, for example. And so years later, when another documentary came out that was more general to their industry but was also obviously going to hurt their bottom line, they got ahead of it, and they hired all these consultants to figure out, okay, we know this, this documentary is coming out. It's going to make people think negatively about what we do. It's going to have an impact. How can we get ahead of it? So they hired PR experts, people, you know, um, and, and my client, for example, was a, was a, PhD, is a, is a PhD in uh, sociological research and so forth, and like, you know, um, uh, uh, testing and, you know, uh, surveys and things like that, you know, getting people's opinions, you know, kind of like polling and monitoring people's opinions and so forth. She's an expert in that kind of stuff. And she was telling me about the other people that they worked with, and one of them was a very famous uh, pollster that, that I'm aware of, or political consultant, rather, and she was telling me that one of the things that he would do is he would put people on these little machines, these little devices that he had created, and then they would have like a video playing like a speech or, or maybe showing some text or someone, you know, talking or a president giving a speech or something like that. Or if it was the corporation, uh, it would be like a, a press release or a statement that they were going to give, and they would have it read out loud. And they would have the person in real time respond either positively or negatively to, to each word. So they could in real time monitor multiple people on these little instruments in real time how they were responding emotionally to each word in the statement. So they could see like, okay, we need to change that word. Okay, let's test it again. So the sophistication behind how, you know, and this is a, this is a major corporation that everybody knows, and they're doing that kind of stuff. And what it really comes down to is they know the exact right words to use, the exact right images, colors, everything to predict what the result will be whenever you're exposed to that information. Now, that point alone should scare people, that our education system is designed in a way that that is even possible. I mean, they can predict these things. So if everybody had a high level of vocabulary, everybody, um, you know, had common sense, everyone uh, thought through things rationally, and they could understand and process a lot of information, like literally any book that Bill Gates could read, any person on the planet should be able to read that book and understand it just as well as he does. But because that's not the case, most people can't handle anywhere near that level of information. They're more easily manipulated. And this is why politicians are really just people who are really good at utilizing words. And I mean, they're salespeople. They're really good at using emotion and so forth and um, you know, painting pictures through words and so forth to get people to act in certain ways. So the education system as a foundation supports all of that, right? And that's why one of our missions, in our mission statement for TechnoTutor, one, one of our points in our mission is to equalize education for all. The other part is to create meaningful work for many. And that has more to do with the fact of, you know, automation and people losing jobs and so forth. We have ways through what we do that people can make a very good income for themselves but in the field of education. Whereas normally you think of education, you think you don't get paid anything. You look at the average, you know, uh, salary of a teacher and so forth. Most people think that there's no way that you can make money in that, right? But from the perspective of equalizing education for all, what we know is, you know, even to have a representative democracy like we have in the U.S., you need at least an IQ between 100 and 98 of the average population, right? And, you know, like I, I was on an um, interview not too long ago or a couple days ago, and I mentioned the point that, uh, there was some research showing that in 
uh, ancient Athens, which as far as we know is the only um, society that had a complete direct democracy, meaning each citizen could directly vote on things. They didn't have representatives, uh, but they had an average IQ of something like 120, which is, would be considered gifted intelligence, which is above a standard deviation away from the average um, in, in our current society. And right now they're showing, and through many of the research that's available, that our IQ overall average-wise in the U.S. is going down, and within the next 20 years we'll be even closer to 96 which means even representative democracy would not be possible. Um, and from a certain perspective, you wouldn't really want a, de a representative democracy at that point because it'd be way too easy to, to manipulate people through words because their education level is too low. They can't process the information. So there's the individual level for a parent of, you know, this is important to you. This is important to not only you right now because, you know, maybe a parent is looking for a way they can, they can work or they realize that their education has failed them and they're not able to meet the, you know, this situation head on, you know, with having to stay home or whatever and totally rethink what they're going to do for work or for money, but also your children who are going to be entering the workforce or entering adult age in the next 15, 20 years, whatever the case may be, depending on their age right now, I mean, they're not being prepared for that. They're still being educated fundamentally in the exact same way that we were educating people in 1920 or 1890. It's the exact same model. Um, and for instance, um, you know, if, if you were to look at the average high school, the, the, the most advanced mathematics that you're going to even be exposed to, I mean, you may not even take this course, but at least it would be offered at your high school right now would generally be calculus right, just basically derivative and integral calculus. And there's very few schools that even go beyond that. There's like the number one private school here in Houston, which I think is one of the top private schools in the country. Um, it's called St. John's School. Uh, they offer things like um, uh, differential equations and abstract algebra. They go into like what you might learn as a first year undergrad in mathematics if you were a mathematics major. Um, but, not, but most of the students in the school don't take those, just the advanced students. But in most schools, the most, and I'm sure you probably remember this even from, from your days in high school, you might be exposed to calculus. That was invented in the 1700s, right, by Isaac Newton. So the most advanced, cal the most advanced mathematics you're even going to be exposed to, and, and let me put it this way, when you go to college, unless you're a mathematics major, you're not going to go beyond calculus. I mean, there, there may be some particular uh, disciplines where you're going to have a little bit more math, but it's not even going to get you up to the 1800s. So we're, we're have, we have a system that on a math scale, in terms of mathematics, is teaching children to have basically a 1700s understanding of mathematics at the most, and they're not even becoming, a, they're not even achieving mastery in that. More mathematics has been invented since the invention of calculus than there was before the invention of calculus. So how is that system gonna gonna prepare? You know, like sometimes the experts say, um, "Well, everybody's gonna need to learn how to be a computer programmer." Well, you know, computer graphics, for example, are based on multivariable calculus at a very minimal level, and artificial intelligence. Many of the algorithms they use for self-learning and so forth are based on understanding gradients and um, you know, basically like higher levels of calculus and so forth. And the optimization that they use is based on, you know, multivariable calculus. So even what a, the average college student would not even be exposed to, you can't, you can't understand how artificial intelligence works fully without having a background in those things. And so even if there are jobs for computer programmers and AI and design and all that stuff, do you really think the average student right now is going to be prepared to handle that information? Because if that were the case, they would probably already be studying those things. Right? But what they find is, you know, the average student can't even keep up with their basic math courses. And by the time, you know, you, go, you look at a student's understanding of math three years after they've taken the course, they remember basically nothing. And this is a major problem, you know. And especially when you consider, um, you know, another point you could go into, for example, is just looking at, um, uh, when you look at, for example, the prison system. Right. I was just looking at an article uh, before we got on our call in our little call here today uh, that was showing there was a study from 2000, I think it was, and they showed that 80 percent of prison inmates. Now, here in Texas, we have the Huntsville State Prison. So I think I think it's one of the original uh, places of the electric chair, if I'm not mistaken. 
Um, we have this prison called Huntsville State Prison here, and they said 80% of the prison inmates there, when they did this study, they found were functionally illiterate. And almost 50% of them, they said 47.8% of them, uh, were showing the basic signs of dyslexia. Right? And so when you start thinking about it, you're like, okay, these people are in prison because they can't read. Now, there's a difference between functional literacy and literacy. But functional literacy, from most, by most standards, is more important than literacy. Like, literacy means literally I can read a sentence or I could write a sentence about something that happened in my, you know, in my day-to-day life. But functional literacy is being able to do things that require literacy. That requ- you know, so, um, well, we can go into all that at some point if you like. But the point is, when you start looking at the percentages of the population that are even functionally literate, just in the general population, there's 30 million adults in the U.S. that are not even functionally literate, okay? Now, that's with an education system in place that is preparing people for jobs that don't exist. Or in other words, it's preparing them for a reality that's, that's very quickly, you know, passing us by. So if that system is producing 30 million adults in the U.S. that are functionally illiterate, how is that system going to handle the situation where automation and AI becomes an obvious prevalent thing. And when you look at, for example, companies like Walmart, um, you know, they have over, I believe it's like 1.2 million employees, at least in the U.S., if not globally. I think it's like 1.8 million globally, something like that. And they're already putting robots in the stores. And there's, there's um, uh, Walmart, there's a Walmart in Florida, I believe, where you can go in, they give you a scanner, the little scanner gun, and you just go scan everything you want, and they put all the, the stuff together for you, and they give it to you at the front. So they're looking at how they can replace their workforce. You know, and McDonald's, for example, is, is putting the touch screens in, and you've probably seen all these different examples, right? Um, mm-hmm. Amazon is licensing their, um, their cashierless supermarkets. I'm not just talking about the convenience stores, because they already have the, the fully um, automated convenience stores. But they have, they're licensing their, their technology for, for cashierless supermarkets where you can go in, and I've seen the pictures of them, you can go in and they have like the self-serve donuts. They have, you know, you can get produce. And you would think, how could you automate that? But they have all this really advanced facial recognition technology and so forth, right? So we, we really, it's, it's almost hard to wrap your mind around the changes that are coming. But at the very least, if a person or a parent especially were to come out of this you know, listening to what we're talking about now, realizing, okay, I really have lost faith in the education system just in the sense of, like, schooling. Meaning, I'm not saying just pull your kids out of school. That's a personal decision. But I'm saying at least realize it's not enough. It's not, it's not designed to prepare them for the world of the future, for the 21st century, for the future where you have to be creative, you have to, be, you have, to have a high level of comprehension, you know, I saw there's this documentary about Bill Gates on Netflix, and his assistants have to carry around like a shopping bag full of books, and they have to change it out every week. That's how much he reads, right? That's a person who's prepared, <laughs> okay? Yeah. But if, if, if your children are not reading at that level and just absorbing information and just, you know, they're not being given that in the school system. And in many cases, what I've seen, and I saw this for myself, the students who are really bright, they get held back and they get very bored and then they get labeled with things like ADHD and all of that. And I've seen cases where you have students as young as third grade and even before that being put on these like ADHD medications when even the research out of Harvard shows that this in, these kind of uh, medications can increase your risk, risk of psychosis and so forth. Right? So all this is known. And so instead of having a solution, it's like we're just going to put Band-Aids on it and try to get people to focus chemically and so forth. Um, when, unfortunately, you can't teach focus, right? And, and I, I mean, you may have experienced this yourself, but whenever something is interesting to me, I want to focus on it. I like focusing on it. Um, and then when I ask my students, you know, in the past who've had like ADHD and have been diagnosed with those things, I say, they say, well, I can't focus. The doctor said I have a problem focusing. I'm like, do you ever have a problem focusing on video games? They're like, no. I can play those for hours. <laughs> and I'm like, well, okay. So what's the issue here? Maybe you don't like focusing on this stuff. And, um, and I've said this before, it's like the teachers then think, okay, I just need to find a way to make things more interesting because then the students will engage. But in reality, when, when things make sense to you, they are already interesting. Or in other words, when they make sense easily, they become interesting. Yep. And so you can't make something interesting that's hard to understand. If you make it easy to understand, it becomes interesting because you see the value in it. 
right? So going back to what we do with TechnoTutor, we're looking at supporting your child or even the parent or the young adult or the learner, whoever the person is, to increase their ability to understand. And then a lot more things become interesting. And so what we find is, in many cases, the students immediately start doing better in school when they start using TechnoTutor because suddenly what wasn't processing before is suddenly to make sense. And now their self-esteem suddenly jumps up because like, oh, this stuff is actually a lot easier than I realized. Just weren't processing it before, right? You know, and as you say that, it's funny because it, it brings two, two conversations that I've had or two situations to mind immediately. I, I can't believe I didn't think of these initially, but um, when my son was right about right about third grade, ironically enough, he was he was getting in trouble for talking a lot. He was, you know, the teacher was complaining that he was disruptive in class, and I, I knew enough because I remembered I used to get in trouble with that too when I was in school. But it was the same thing. I was done with my work. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, was done, too. and I was just having to sit there and wait for the rest of the class. And then I would get in trouble for being done too soon and then being bored. And so we talked to the school, and at, at the time, we would just thought, he, he's extremely bright. There's nothing wrong with yeah. him at all. There's no, there's no problems. You're just boring him. <laughs> that, that was all we could When we talked to him, he was very blunt about it. He's like, I'm bored. He was yeah. done with all of his work, and we went and talked to them about, well, can we, you know what, can we look at maybe getting him tested? Maybe he's too advanced. Maybe he needs to move up. Maybe we need to challenge him more. And I don't blame the teacher because all she was doing was quoting back to us the regulations that the school has to follow. Right. The system, quote, unquote, was doing everything that it could to hold him back. They would right. not test him at all. They wouldn't even consider it. And that was very telling to me. And we still have that same struggle with him now. We just have to live with it, you know. So we try to challenge him as best as we can. But, um, and then secondly, so I have a friend who, who teaches in high school, out in a local high school here. And this was back when Common Core was first implemented. And that, mm. boy, we, we won't go down that rabbit hole because that's a whole other topic of conversation. But It is, yeah. He brought up the point to me where he was extremely frustrated, where he said that what, what it has done in the, the system that we've created today, if we just put this all together and not single out Common Core as part of the education right. system, what they've had to do is take the, the really exceptionally smart kids and push them down into the middle and then take all of the kids that like we're addressing here that maybe are struggling with literacy just can't keep up and it's forcing them up into the middle so that everybody keeps going through. And to me, I think that that just, that just feeds right into the conversation that we're talking about here. When you have all of these exceptionally bright kids who are being told, I mean, essentially don't be so bright. And then all of these other kids who are really struggling, telling them, ah, oh, that's okay, you can still get through. You know, what are we really doing? How are we preparing anybody for, for real life? Yeah, I, um, I had a, a family that I worked with um, a number of years ago where when we sat down and talked to her, I mean, she was in tears because she had a daughter that was, she had some kind of, form of cerebral palsy, um, she had learning disability, like all these different issues. I mean, it was like a really severe situation. And from the perspective of the school, they, when they tested her, it was like basically a third grade ability, but she was, you know, like 14, right? And the, the state or the district or whatever it was had, had changed some funding things or whatever it was, some structures in the school and they removed completely the special education classes. And so that student, because she was like, I don't know exactly how old she was, but I think she was in eighth grade uh, age-wise, she had to go into a regular eighth grade classroom, even though ability-wise, and even just physically, she, you know, she was, you know, clearly there was issues. You could see it physically. And 
the mom was just didn't know what to do. She's like, how are they expecting her to keep up at an eighth grade level? Well, it's fascinating because when I put the, the girl on Techno Tutor, I was teaching her, you know, the same things that you were talking about with your son doing the uh, medical terminology, the same thing, and, and, then, and then she could learn it. And the mom was like, whoa. And I said, so, you know, that's not going to change the cerebral palsy and all of that, but the ability to learn to absorb information, we can have an effect on that. And so her eyes were, like, completely wide. Right? And so, you know, it, it may, I mean, it's interesting, too, that point you brought up about, you know, bringing the, the, the bright kids down to the middle. Um, from a certain perspective, it's like when you're at a higher level in society, you don't want competition. You know, I don't feel that way, but that is, I think, the general, you know, when you have a system based on competition, then you don't want competition because, that, you know, you, you want to, destroy the competition, right? Yeah. And I think we're seeing the same thing right now with what's going on just today where a lot of the small businesses and restaurants and things are having to close. I and mean, I think a lot of them are going to be out of business permanently. They just can't sustain themselves right now when there's no business. Yeah. So that feeds into these big mega corporations eating everything up and just being the only ones left stand, standing to a certain degree, right? And this, this, is a, this is a big, big problem because here in America, I mean, we're – Small business, in a in a sense, is is what our our country is founded upon, you know. And you know, it's fascinating. Like I, I love reading um, biographies and autobiographies, but also just histories and things. And something that can seem mundane when you can process it, it, it can it can be very fascinating. And I read um, the the story of John Deere, you know, the tractors and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. And how that started as a family business, and it's just really fascinating to see. And that was a big common theme in, you know, the beginning of the Foundations of America and so forth. And, and you don't hear about that a lot in the education system. It, it, you don't really get that side of things at all. And um, more, and, and again, and I, you know this being, you know, an, uh, an entrepreneur and self-employed and so forth, and then you have a lot of uh, things that you do, you, you have to have an ability to, to think and, prob and problem solve. Right? Yeah. And when you have a very low vocabulary and a very low reading ability, you can't think and solve problems because words themselves are the tools of thought. And there's, there was research, and we talk about this when we, when we show TechnoTutor to individual families and so forth. We, we explain all the research behind it. But for anyone who's interested, you can go look up um, Johnson O'Connor and his research on vocabulary. Um, the University of Illinois, um, I think it's University of Illinois, which has like one of the – I think it's the top, you know, world-renowned reading centers or, or centers for, like, the study of reading and so forth. They published his annotated bibliography. It's, like, 70 years of research um, showing that your vocabulary itself and your ability to understand and recognize words and, and process their meanings immediately, unconsciously, without having to think about it, the higher that is, the higher your income. Um, the more success you have in all areas of life. They could predict your SAT scores. They could predict your IQ, all number of things. In fact, um, you know, there was even one study that was called, uh, released in 1970 that they did called uh, Civil Disorders. And they said that each word that's learned by a person in society in some way statistically reduces the level of crime as a whole. Right, so even uh, and it goes right back to that study I was talking about earlier, where you look at 80% of the people in the state prison here are functionally illiterate. It explains a lot of things, and it's not because they're bad people that they're there. It's because they don't know how to get the things in society that other people it just seems to come right naturally to them. And you see the same things, um, for example, in school with regards to bullying and so forth. You have the kids who are really smart; everything seems to come easy, and then you have the other kid who might struggle with certain things like reading. And his way of being equal from a certain perspective is to use aggression and, and, and force and things like that be, and to kind of, you know, bring the smart kid down to his level to a certain degree, right? And so you have all of these problems. And, and that's another thing, too, within the school system is you can't really control all those other external stimulus or stimuli that, that happen in the school system, like bullying and stuff like that. Um, also, like, what things is the teacher saying? Like, what are their beliefs? You know, what, how are they influencing each other? There's so many things that if, let me put it this way, if a parent wanted to either totally homeschool their child or they just want to supplement what they're doing in school and make sure that regardless of what's happening in school, their child is getting the most effective education they can possibly get, 
I mean, they develop the most advanced reading skill that they can possibly develop. Um, they can, uh, over time, develop the ability to read and understand any book that exists and to do something with that information. I mean, imagine if a child had the education level and the reading ability. Think of all the opportunity there is right now from home to make money just with what's going on right now. Like you could be 3D printing ventilators or masks or, you know, you, a child could start b building a business right now. And you take someone like Warren Buffett, you read his autobiographies or his biographies rather. By the time he was 12 years old, he had read every book on wealth building in the entire, um, you know, w w Omaha Public Library or whatever it was that he had there. And I think you're in that same area, if, if I'm not mistaken, right? And, you know, he started his first business when he was nine years old. And when he, he went to, he graduated high school, went to college, and finished college by the time he was 19. You know, and he actually, he was at Wharton Business School, which is like the top business school in the world, I think, by many standards, and uh, dropped out after a couple of years. He's like, I know more than my teachers. And he wasn't just being arrogant. Clearly, he did. <laughs> if you just look at his track record. But the reality is he read and could process all that stuff in those books. Um, and it's not good enough to just pick up the book and be able to say the words out loud. Your brain actually has to understand it and do something with that information. And, you know, we may not have time to go into all of that in this, in this conversation, but I did another um, uh, talk. It's, it's on my YouTube channel, and uh, it's called um, – I did two of them. One's called The Red Pill of Education, and that's more to do with just general processing ability, even as adults, and why our education system has – and our education has failed us. But then I did another one called Why Your Kids Can't Read and Why This Matters, where I go more into the specifics of how our children are being taught to read. And all the current approaches and how we're being taught to read is creating a situation where there becomes a ceiling, a limit on your reading ability. And when we test people who even at high levels of society, like doctors and lawyers and so forth, when we test them outside of their, their law or medical vocabulary, they read at many times lower than a high school level. And the average person tends to... Hey, you still there? Can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me okay? Oh, um, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Perfect, yeah, this is... What's going on here? Can you hear me I can't, it dropped a little bit, but I, I think I can hear you. Okay, one second, let me see what's going on here. Oh, there we go. I can hear you clear now. Okay, yeah, okay, cool. Man, I think there's maybe a delay or something. It it sounds like there's a little bit of a delay. It's, I mean, this is what Free Conference Call has been experiencing over the last couple weeks here, so it's not unheard of. We just roll with the punches, you know? Yeah, no problem. All right, so I will, I'll follow up with my producer, and I'll make sure that, that we catch this and we'll edit it out. Um, I think this will be... I know you had just mentioned your YouTube channel, so what I'll do then is I'll just transition right into the close. And we'll talk about, you know, hey, if somebody would like to learn more about TechnoTutor, get in touch with you, what's the best way to contact, and then we'll, we'll wind it down. Very good. Cool. Okay. All right, so Cameron, and I know you had just mentioned a little earlier about some of the videos that you have on YouTube. So if someone in the audience here or, or someone listening at home has, uh, this has really struck a chord with them and they feel like they would like to know more, where can they find out more about TechnoTutor? Where can they see some of these videos? Or, or what's the best way for them to, to contact you and TechnoTutor? Uh, okay, cool. The best way to just, if you want to just see TechnoTutor itself, um, would be to go to the website. And it's techno, T-E-C-H-N-O dash, which is like the hyphen, tutor, T-U-T-O-R dot com. So it's techno dash tutor dot com. Um, you can also, if you want to kind of do more of like, you know, that deep dive sort of uh, thing, you can go on to my YouTube channel. I have a lot of stuff um, that I've, you know, recorded, like videos and audio things um, over the years. Um, also videos of my kids and other testimonials of other people using technology. There's a lot on there, other talks that I've done about education and so forth. 
Um, and that is on my YouTube channel. My username is Cameron V. Cope, V as in Victor. Um, my middle name is Vaughn, but sometimes people don't know that. So I'll say Victor V. So it's Cameron, C-A-M-E-R-O-N-V-C-O-P-E. -E. And I think you just go to YouTube slash user slash Cameron V. Cope. Um, that'll probably be the best way. And also you can look up TechnoTutor, all one word, uh, T-E-C-H-N-O-T-U-T-O-R on Facebook. We have a lot of stuff on there. Um, and any of those ways, there's contact forms if you want to get in touch with us or anything. So I'd be happy to answer any questions or chat with anybody who's, who wants to know more. And I always like to, I always like to end on a on a constructive note. So let's say that we have really struck a chord with someone, and they need help with their education. Maybe it's them. Maybe they realize, hey, I, I think I fall into that category, and I need some help with this. Or maybe they are struggling at home, trying to figure out what is the best way that that I can help my kids. Uh, that I can start to work with them or that I can supplement during this time of uncertainty with education. If we were sitting across the table from that individual, what's, what's some advice or, or words of wisdom that you would pass along to them? Great question. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say make a priority to look into TechnoTutor. Um, and the reason why I say that is because there's very little specific advice I can give you that you can apply without raising your processing ability and so forth. But the really great news from that perspective is when you get involved with TechnoTutor, you also get involved with us. We have groups um, for entrepreneurs who are applying this in their life, and you can see some of those videos of those folks on my YouTube channel. But we also have um, a group for parents specifically um, or people who want to have children, how do we apply TechnoTutor um, from the perspective of educating our children? You know, I'd mentioned my son Max, he's three and a half. He's already reading at a second grade level. Um, and that's not a coincidence. You know, we started this company well before he was born. There's a reason for that. And my daughter is one and a half, and she's already basically, um, she'd be the smartest kid in the kindergarten class in terms of everything she can do now. So there is support there. Um, it is more simple than you think. And you can really take your children's education to a much higher level in a very short period of time a day when you have TechnoTutor. But the, the one thing, if you could take something away otherwise, is that it really comes down to that point that you, you brought up in the very beginning, which is that point of gratitude. Because with gratitude, when, you're, when you slow down and you feel grateful for what you have, even though you see lots of challenges, it allows you to slow down a little bit. And that allows you to have a little bit more patience. Because... From my perspective as a parent, patience is the most important thing because when you're patient, you end up not doing things you shouldn't do and you, you, you communicate more clearly, even with the level of communication and, and so forth that you have now, just by breathing, slowing down, having a little patience, it, you, you end up um, creating a little bit of space, let's say, for, your, for you and your children and your spouse to just kind of slow things down. A lot of times as parents, we tend to think everything's life or death, even when we really know it's not. And by slowing down, we kind of give ourselves that moment of, okay, hold on, is this really a big deal? And then it allows you to, in those moments when something really is an urgent thing, that, you know, you've built the trust of, I'm not abusing urgency. I'm not abusing, you know, emergency. I'm, I'm really, when something is urgent, it really is urgent. When it's not, we slow down, we take a step back, and we breathe, and we apply some patience because, the one thing that we don't get in the school system is patience. It's like, nope, we got deadlines, everybody got to move forward, we leave no child behind, but then a lot of force is required. And so if you'd like to use less force in your parenting and create more cooperation and communication and stability from that perspective, um, obviously having TechnoTutor is the one thing I can recommend for that, but having and applying patience within that is going to get you a lot of the way there just from that perspective. So I hope that's helpful for anybody, but again, feel free to reach out to me, watch my videos. You can see I'm like an open book. You can go back years into my life and see the things that I've been saying. It's, nothing has changed. The only thing that's different now is that we have a lot more people who have applied what we've said and have taken their education for themselves and their families to a whole other level. So all of that is out there if you're looking for it. Well, Cameron, I want to thank you very much again for, for taking your time out today to, to talk with me and with my audience. And 
I will definitely uh, again I'm a I'm a client uh, you and I are in pretty regular communication just via Facebook it might not be one-on-one -on -one, but I, I'm privy to all that information and I am a, a walking testimonial as well so please if anyone has any questions or wants to get some information from me directly feel free to reach out um, so again you can reach us online at www.survivingthesystem.org there is a contact us page on there that will get directly to me and of course you can check out all of our past episodes on there as well under the archive don't forget to visit me on Facebook facebook.com slash surviving the system and on Twitter at STS the podcast any of those three options have a way to get a hold of me directly please do not be shy don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions comments suggestions and especially if you have a story that you would like to tell or if you know of someone who has a story that you think should be told please do not hesitate to reach out to me that's what I'm here for uh, is to really get these stories out there and let people know what's going on and especially to let them know that despite all of the challenges that we're facing despite all of the challenges that are in front of us there's hope there's always light at the end of the tunnel and we will get through this so thank you all for joining me and I look forward to speaking with you next week